I remember going to the hospital, I don't know how many years ago it's been, and holding Josiah as a brand new little baby. Brand new little baby. I remember when he spoke and he was a tenor. And now he's up here singing and every time I hear him, he's more and more a bass every time I hear him. You guys did a fantastic job. Great job, great job. And that voice will stop changing pretty soon, Josiah. Trust all of us guys, we know what you're going through there, buddy. We all know, amen? If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start here a five-week series, the, the month of January. And we're going to start this series about, it's going to be on anxiety, worry, and stress. Now, we're going to spend, I don't know, at least two weeks. Let's put it that way. We'll spend at least two weeks in this first sermon. We're going to take our time. Um, and, and I want to just kind of give you a, the way I'm going to lay it out just so that you know where I'm going with it. Um, <clears throat> we're going to spend the first couple weeks at least, depending on how long this first, first sermon takes, talking about the reasons why we have the stress the reasons why we have the anxiety and the worry. Then we'll spend at least a couple more weeks talking about how we should try to handle that, and, and it'll be more than two weeks probably. It may even go into February. Um, we'll just see where the Lord takes us, amen? Kind of see where the Lord goes. I'm not going to stress out about it. <laughs> no? Okay. All right. Statistics tell us, and it depends. Boy, you talk about different places for different statistics depends on what uh, spot you pull up on Google you can get totally different stats about things but uh, some of the stats that I found this week I, I found two or three big spots things that I thought I could trust the CDC places like that I'm just gonna leave that alone but places like that I found stats on there and I thought okay I'm gonna share those with you they say that, st that stress is now, in, it was in 2022, it was in a study in October, that it was higher than it had ever been before. It's reported by people that stress is a bigger problem than it has ever been before. It reported seven major things that people report are the most stressful in their lives. They say the job, money, health, relationships, poor diet, media overload, and lack of sleep, which I thought was ironic because if you stress out about it, you get a lack of sleep, and the lack of sleep causes more of the stress and then kind of a cycle there. Seven major things that people mention are the biggest things for giving them stress depending again on what stats you look at, more than 25 million Americans have some sort of anxiety disorder. In reading about anxiety disorders, GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder, kept coming up, GAD, and it said that almost one in every five adults has some sort of GAD, whether it is light, medium or heavy, whether it's just a slight disorder or whether it's a very heavy disorder. 6.8 million adults claim, again, depending on what ones you look at, to have a heavy anxiety disorder, okay? That's not even looking at the statistics of children under 21, the age uh, that, they, that they use to, to define children, the numbers are skyrocketing in terms of anxiety disorders. And in fact, if you look at all those numbers, a little over 40% of those people are being treated. In other words, uh, nearly 60% of people who claim to have a anxiety, an anxiety disorder are not being treated at all. 
they are really struggling with this anxiety. Now you say, how do you define anxiety? Well, let me say this. Uh, again, different websites, different places to have different definitions. I'm just gonna say it's a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. We don't know how 2023 is going to turn out. Amen? We don't know where it's going to go. But I do want to remind you through this whole study, we worship a God who does. Amen? Now having said that, that's what we're going to talk about. I'll say more about that in a minute. Let's read God's Word. Would you stand with me? Matthew chapter 6. Now in your Bible, it's probably a certain color. The writing that you're looking at is probably a certain color. Amen? It's probably red, isn't it? Jesus is speaking. Now, I don't know if your Bible is like mine. It gives a title for sections. Mine calls this, boy, you ready? You want to make a million dollars in 2023? My Bible calls this the cure for anxiety. For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. And I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today and then gone tomorrow, is thrown into the furnace, will not he much more do so for you? Oh, people of little faith, do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Oh, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we worry, we fret, we stress. Sometimes we get anxious. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to focus on you for the study. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be able to be honest with ourselves about where we're at in this process. Some of us, Lord, may be better than others. Some may be good at handling certain things and not other things. Lord, wherever we're at in this spectrum, I pray that you'd allow us to see these verses for what they are, perfect, and apply them to our lives where we're at. Lord, I know that all of us come in with different challenges, different things happening in our lives. Some of us, a lot of anxiety right now. Some feel like things are going well, and Lord, that just means things are coming. Wherever we're at, whoever we are, whatever we're facing, I pray that we would always see you as the key to the answers in our life. And I pray that you'd be with us as we try to open up what is a very difficult subject and apply your words to that in our lives. For it's in very... God's very precious name. All God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, let me say this. 
I want to start the series by being very clear. I'm not a doctor. I didn't get a whole lot of response out of you. I don't know if you, that surprises you. I'm not a doctor. Um, and I want you to seriously understand, I am not minimizing in any way the realities of anxiety, worry, and stress. You want to throw fear in there? Throw fear in there too. I am not minimizing these in any way, shape, or form. Everybody hear what I said? They are all very real. Some of us know how real they are and how difficult they are to deal with in our lives. Yes? If you don't have those challenges, you may want to thank God for that, but I bet you you know someone very close to you who does have those challenges. Yes? So I'm not minimizing them at all. They are giants in our lives. And I will tell you that I'm not trying to, in the process of these just five weeks, say that there is some kind of quick fix to these things in our lives. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say, just do one or two things and get over it and move on. That is not my intention. I don't want to minimize it. I don't want you to think that I'm taking these lightly. In fact, I can tell you firsthand, I know that these are real and how difficult they are to deal with. I know that. So I'm not minimizing them at all. But I want to suggest to you over today and the next four weeks at least, the month of January, that through Christ we can defeat anything in our lives. Anything. Notice, I'm going to say this several times today, next week, however long this takes. I didn't leave any wiggle room in there. We can defeat anything in Christ. We say amen to that, but do we really believe it? I want to start with anxiety, and then we'll go to its cousins. And I'll tell you, even as I say anxiety, um, you're going to hear me say stress, you're going to hear me say worry. I'm going to bounce back and forth. Um, at first, I was trying to keep from that. I've already got the next couple sermons ready, and I was trying to make sure that I didn't say one word another week and you know keep one word at a time. And then I realized, no, I'm just going to, if I, if I say it and I apply it and use different words, just know I'm, I'm hoping that the Lord is going to use those things and apply it to your life where you need it, okay? So, you know, we'll talk about the, its cousins, if you want to call it worry, fear, stress. We'll talk about those in the next coming weeks, too. These are all very complex. These are, these are not just something easy, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's easy. They're, they're pretty complicated spiritual issues, mental issues issues, physical, emotional, sometimes genetic issues. And, and depending on what circumstances you face, sometimes we have different challenges in different lives because we have different circumstances than other people have. And I recognize that I don't have some of the challenging circumstances that some of you do. So I want to make sure you understand that I appreciate that, that I respect that as I try to share these things that I think God's Word says. Understand, I'm not trying to suggest that there's one size fits all. Okay? I don't care what you got for Christmas. If it said one size fits all, it lied. There's no such thing. Okay? I've got a couple of hats that say that, and they, and they say one size fit all. And I, have, I wear it for about five seconds on my big giant cranium up here, and I start getting a headache. It doesn't fit. There is no such thing as one size fits all, unless you're talking about Jesus, because he fits everybody. That's the only way that I would take that one size fits all approach. But just as, as we all mourn differently, I've been reminded of that this week, we all mourn differently, correct? Well, we all deal with things differently that cause us stress. But I want you to recognize, you're outlined there if you have it, the answer to anything that we face in this life, whether it's stress, anxiety, money, relationships, I don't care what it is, the answer to whatever we face in this life is Jesus. It starts with Jesus. Now, if you try to find your answer somewhere else and you try to fit in Jesus later, you're going to have issues. You got to start with Jesus. You got to start with Jesus. And we're never alone, people reported, as I looked at some of those statistics that I was reading to you, um, 
A lot of people that are facing anxiety and stress and worry and fear report that they feel alone in that battle. I want to remind you, you are never alone with Jesus. You're never alone with Jesus. Now I want to say this again. Uh, and I want to emphasize this again. I haven't said this specifically yet, but I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying here. I, 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 I'm not saying to you that you should never take medication. Uh, uh, in listening and reading some stuff and trying to get ready for this, recognizing that I'm anything but an expert in these things. Oh, I'm good at worrying. Now I'm an expert at worrying. But in trying to fix it or how to treat it, I am far from an expert. And so in trying to read and, and listen to some people speak and, and uh, look and check what people thought, um, boy, there's a lot of different opinions about what Christians think about medication. I'm going to tell you right now, I am not up here telling you you should not take medication for a season. I am not telling you you should not take medication for a season. I'm not going to be up, I'm not going to tell you what medication you should take. Pray to the Lord, please. Talk to your doctor. Okay? Talk to your doctor. Pray to the Lord that you have the right doctor. If you haven't prayed to God about what doctor you see, uh, what are you doing? Amen? If you got issues about your doctor and you never prayed about your doctor, could it be that you never prayed about your doctor? Okay, so pray about that. Okay? If prescribed, even by a Christian counselor or someone like that for a season who knows your situation and knows who you are and what you're dealing with and knows your health and your body and you trust after prayer that this is the person to care for you and treat you, then take the medicine. And if you feel God is telling you not to take the medicine, then don't take the medicine. That is not my point in studying this at all. Are you with me? So I want to move that out of the way. Some people are very much against medicine. Here's what I tell you to do. If that's what you think the Holy Spirit's telling you to do, then don't take medicine. And if you think the Holy Spirit's telling you to take medicine, then, ladies and gentlemen, take the medicine. Do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. It's not about the medicine. It's about what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do. Are you with me? Okay. I want to get over that right now. I'm not saying don't go to therapy. I am saying this, Christian counselors, there's a lot of great Christian counselors out there, okay? Who you're taking advice from, make sure that they're taking advice from Jesus. Don't go take the advice from somebody who's not taking advice from Jesus because chances are you're not going to get godly advice. But definitely there's some fantastic Christian counselors out there that can be helpful as well. God can use people. He can use, you know, counselors. He can use doctors. He can use all of these different approaches to help you. God can use them to help you. Okay? Are you with me? But what I am saying is this. After having said all that, I'm going to get that out of the way. I won't talk about that anymore the rest of the study. Our hope lies in Jesus Christ first and foremost. And if you're going at any problem, not just anxiety, any problem, okay? You got smelly feet. And that's your problem for 2023. And everybody else in the house knows it. Because they can smell when you take your shoes off. And you think that's a joke. Uh, listen, I'm telling you, go to God first. God cares about everything in your life. Even your smelly feet. He cares about, you go to God first, asking God to help show you how you work anything out in your life. I don't care what it is. You got a problem with a dog barking next to you next door? Don't go to that neighbor until you pray first. Are you with me? And if you, and if you would say, man, I need, to go, I need to pray before I go to my next door neighbor and talk about the bark, barking dog, then don't you think you should be praying about anxiety, stress, worry, fear before anything else? And then let God direct you to a doctor, to a counselor, to whatever. Wherever he takes you. You with me? Our hope, our, our hope always lies in Jesus first and foremost. Okay, so we start with anxiety. I gave you the statistics. They are growing. 
you know, you can say that's because we're defining it differently, because we're identifying it more, or because the stress is happening more, or because we all have cell phones. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. Okay? I don't know why it's happening. I just know the statistics are trending up, especially in kids. Especially in kids. Is that amazing? That's supposed to be the carefree time. And the anxiety numbers are like steeped up like that. The numbers are going up and up every day. Mm, man. Now, I wanted to just think about these verses that we read this morning and spend a couple weeks just kind of slowly breaking these verses down, taking our time, and wherever it gets, when we have, you know, time left for the Lord's Supper, then that's where we'll stop and we'll pick it up next week. Okay? The word for anxious, look at verse 25 again, chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is speaking, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, he says, for this reason, talking about what he had been talking about ahead of time, before that, what's he talking about in verse 24, no man can serve two masters. Interesting, that's the context there, did you catch that? He says, nobody can serve two masters, either you let me give you the Lincoln version. Either you're serving God or you're serving Satan. You're, fa- you're, you're serving one or the other. Having said that, for that reason, I say to you, don't be anxious about your life. That word anxious, that word anxious, it's probably um, translated differently in a lot of your Bibles now. I have New American, this is my old New American Standard, and then I have a new New American Standard. I believe it was 98. I can't remember the year that the new New American Standard came out. And, and one says worry and one says anxious. They translate it a little differently. Okay? Um, <clears throat> that word for anxious, the Greek word, actually meant to be uneasy or to be distracted. So Jesus is talking, so we know it's important. Are you with me? Don't be distracted. Okay. Jesus is talking. And Jesus says, you can only serve one master at a time. So don't be distracted. Don't get focused on yourself, Satan, whatever. Focus on Christ. He doesn't say bad times aren't going to happen. He doesn't say because you're a Christian, everything's going to come up roses and hunky-dory. He says, Because you can serve Christ, you can serve that one master. Don't get distracted and focus on Satan. Focus on Christ. Don't get distracted. And then he says, okay, here's what he wants you to do. He wants you to look at these ideas about anxiety or worry. Number one, and again, we're going to focus on why some of this happens for the next couple weeks. I want you to see, are there some of these things from these verses that are causing me stress, that are causing me anxiety, causing me to worry, that's really me, and I need to pray about this, and I need to start attacking this with prayer. Kalan said it perfectly. It's it's about prayer. Okay, we'll talk about it's God's word in a minute too, but you know, you've gotta attack it with prayer. Number one, he says in verse 26, look at verse 26. He says, look at the birds. And I want you to imagine he's out there. He's walking around. He's talking. He's teaching on the, on the mount, on this little mountain, on this little hill. And then he says, he goes, guys, look up here at the birds. And you could probably hear the birds while he was talking, right? Tweet, tweet, tweet. Deedly deet, deet, tweedly deet. You know that's what you were thinking. Don't even. Okay. And so he hears them tweeting and he says, guys, look. He just talked about distracted. He probably noticed some of them are distracted. He says, look at these birds. So they look up, and he says, look at these birds. They don't sow, they don't reap. You know, all the hard work that you guys do so you can eat. That's what they had to do. They had to plant, they had to care for it. So that's a big word, water and care for it and pull the weeds and do all that. They don't reap, they don't have to pull it out and, and pull the bad off of the good and cook with it and use it and store it and everything that it took to have food at that time. He says, they don't have to do any of that. See these birds? These happy-go-lucky, you know, tweet, 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 look, drop, flying around. They don't do any of that. And guess what? They don't even gather into their barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Notice they don't feed themselves. He feeds them. He says, aren't you worth a lot more than they are? Hmm. You see, number one, I think one of the reasons why we get anxious, one of the reasons why we worry so much, and again, I'm going to say this again, I'm not trying to minimize, I'm just saying here's maybe one of the reasons why we worry so much is we don't understand just how much God really loves us. He takes care of the birds. How many, how many birds are out there? Yeah, who knows? How many birds? Okay, you don't know. How many needs do they have? I mean, who knows? And God takes care of all of that. Now, I don't know exactly what's going to be in heaven and not heaven. Maybe heaven will have birds. Maybe they won't ruin our windshields in heaven. Maybe that's what heaven's about. I don't know. But I know this, they don't have a soul. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross and rise again for birds. But he did that for you and me. And yet, he loves the birds so much, he provides them an entire system to make sure that they have worms, they have seeds, they have whatever it is that they need. And again, I'm not an expert about birds either. But whatever it is that birds need, guess what? They got it. And if they ain't got it, they fly south for the winter or north for the summer or whatever it is. I don't know, east for the vacation time. I don't know, what, I don't know which ways they fly. I just know they know where to go. He builds into them so they know exactly what to do at the right time. He puts that instinct into them. He does all of that so these birds can live. Think about everything it takes between trees and, and, and you know, seeds and all of the stuff, the worms and the water and everything else that the birds need. He takes care of all of that for these birds. Now, the point is, how much more does he love you? I mean, it's one of these things I think we say, yeah, God loves us. We'll even wear a t-shirt, God loves you. We'll put it on our bumper sticker. We'll say it. But do we really, really, really believe it? Do we really live it? Understand it? Does it impact your day to know that he died on the cross just for you? If you were the only person that ever lived, He'd have died for you. That's how much he loves you. He cares about every single little thing I was teasing about uh, in your life. I was teasing about your smelly feet. And when I used to teach Sunday school for junior hires, long time ago, those junior hires are now about 40 years old, I think. Long time ago. Um, I used to tell them, Jesus even cares about what clothes you're wearing right now. When you get up in the morning, don't just get up and get dressed. Because Jesus loves you so much, he wants to have input. He wants to direct you. He wants you to trust him for what you wear. So that's silly. No, it's not silly. He cares about every single little thing about you. Think about all the little things he had to do to take care of a bird. If he does all those little tiny details to take care of a bird, he cares about these little details in your life. He cares about you that much. See, I don't, I don't think we totally grasp how much God loves us. That's how important you are. He loves you so much. He cares about everything in your life, the people in your life, the relationships in your life, the health in your life, where you're at, what you're doing, your dreams, your thoughts, your goals, everything in your life, he cares. That's how much he loves you. And he loves you. He cares about everything. 
Now, he cares about your, your dreams, your friends. You, you see, anxiety is a way of life for some people. It's the way they live their life. Some people are stressed all the time. It's like they go from one emergency to another. And they're always in like, you know, panic mode. Because they're always uncertain. They don't seem to grasp the idea God is in charge. You say, I don't know where this is going to go. Really? You mean you don't know the future? Yeah, that's right. None of us know the future. See, you, you may think you know where you're going for lunch today. You may think you know what you want to eat today. You may think you're going to go back to work on whatever day after your vacation. You may think that you know and you've got things planned out. Now, side note, I'm not telling you not to plan. I'm just telling you, you may think you have things all planned out. And I think God just kind of chuckles at our plans sometimes. I'm, I'm going to be 54. Four? Yeah. I'm going to be 54 later this month. My plan that I made when I was 15 says that I'm supposed to be very soon the sole owner of the Dodgers very soon I had it planned out baby I think God just chuckled ha 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 when you turn 54 you won't even be able to afford to go to a game let alone own them <laughs> amen I mean Dodger dogs are expensive now like let alone own them come on like I'm not telling you don't plan. I'm not telling you don't make the plans. I'm not telling you you shouldn't plan. I'm not saying wing it. What I'm telling you is God is the real planner. He's the one that knows the future. And for some people who go from like worry to worry to worry to worry to anxiety to anxiety to anxiety, they've forgotten the fact God has always been in charge. We were talking about Joseph this morning in Sunday school and Bible study and how, you know, for 13 years he lived as a slave. I don't know if I could stand it for three days, let alone 13 years. Amen? That's how terrible, horrible that is. 13 years. But guess what? God was in charge the entire time. Planning it out. In fact, one of the things we talked about in a Bible study this morning, not only was God in charge of Joseph the whole time, think about this. Um, when he was made, now the brothers sold him to those travelers. The travelers quickly sold him to Potiphar. Remember the story? Who, who, who did Potiphar work for? Pharaoh. Right? He's like captain of the guard. He's like the muscle man. He's the killer. He's the executioner. Okay, he's the man. Okay. Um, it says that quickly Potiphar made him second in charge. In fact, it says, the Bible says that, that, that Potiphar made him his personal assistant. Isn't that interesting? What do you think a personal assistant would have done for a person like Potiphar? Just, just imagine. What do you think he would have done? Maybe he'd have got out his clothes. Maybe. Maybe he'd uh, he'd have made him you know his lunch, put it in his you know his Scooby Scooby Doo lunch pail. Uh, maybe he would have um, uh, you know maybe he would have gone with him and traveled with him to work, take care of him, fed the horses or the donkeys or whatever I don't know the Lamborghini whatever he had when he went to work. Just I mean I'm just coming up with some ideas. Maybe he would have gone with Potiphar to work, and Potiphar would have said, hey, look, I got a big presentation to make to the boss today, so I need you to stand over here, and I need you to hit the button on the, on the, on the you know, on the machine, on the, on the, oh, what are those things used to be called? Those slides. Projector, thank you. Couldn't think of that old-fashioned word. Hey, listen, I'm in the 23rd, I'm just 2023. Forget those projectors, man. So, you know, maybe that's what he's doing. I'm messing around with you. What I'm saying is this. He would have been doing a whole lot of stuff for Potiphar who, by the way, had unique access to Pharaoh. 
could it be that Joseph got an inside look at how to behave, how to dress, how to talk, how to act in front of Pharaoh in serving Potiphar? Could it be? Potiphar is one of the only people in Egypt that could actually talk to, touch, interact with Pharaoh himself. And guess what Joseph ends up doing? Being vice Pharaoh. He's the VP, the original VP, vice Pharaoh. Starts with a P if you guys don't know how to spell. Come on. Okay, hey, are you with me? Was God in charge the whole time? Amen, he was in charge the whole time. God was in charge the whole time. I only got like two. I'm going to do it again. God was in charge the whole time. You get where I'm at, people? Should we get in our cars and, and, and the, the fuel light starts dinging? Ding, ding, ding. Does yours do like mine when it gets to a certain point? First, it's just lit. It just lights up. Then when I get down to a certain point, only men get to, apparently. Uh, then it starts dinging. Then it starts dinging. That's annoying. Okay? Uh, you, you get to that point, and then it ding, ding, dings. When it stops dinging, you know you're in real big trouble. Right? We get in our cars, and the light comes on, the fuel light, and we think, you know, what more could happen? Oh. I just put a bunch of money in the car and now it says check engine. What more could happen? Could it be that God, and I, I'm just throwing this out there. Could it be that God wants you at the brake shop that day because if you'd been out driving that day, you'd have gotten into an accident. I mean, could it be that God has somebody at the brake shop who needs to hear about Jesus, and you're not going to go to the break shop, let's be honest, unless you're going to have to go to the break shop. Could it be that someone at the break shop needs someone to just be a Christian example because later in their lives, somebody's going to witness to them, and they're going to remember, I remember that nice guy, and what he, remember I got in his car, and, and the, the light was on, but I looked down, and there was a Bible on the seat, and it made me wonder, it made me think, you see, you, you see where I'm trying to go with this? God is in charge the whole time. God's in charge the whole time. Now, don't misunderstand me. The story of Joseph being a slave, he was still a slave. It was still hard. He still had bad days as slaves do. Okay? But what I'm telling you is this. Just trust. Just be faithful. Because God is in charge. You never know. You never know how God is working. Let's look at the next one. And we'll probably just get one more. Because I want to take our time and really think about why do we cause ourselves so much anxiety? I mean... We cause ourselves a lot of it, sometimes more than what other people cause us. Again, I'm not belittling if you have chemically or you have issues happening to you outside of, you, uh, of your own self that are happening that are causing the stuff. I get it. But I'm saying, how much of this stuff do we cause ourselves? Look at verse 27. And which of you... By being, a, I love, you know, sometimes Jesus talks and I think to myself, he had a little sarcastic side, not the sinful part, but the, you know, the funny part. He says, hey, which of you worry warts is going to live longer because you worry? That's the Lincoln version. You see why I didn't write the Bible. Amen? He said, and which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit? Let me put it in our words today. How, which of you by worrying could add one inch to your life? In fact, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? We recognize now, physically, worry 
physically affects our health. Physically. Skin disorders. Ulcers. All kinds of stuff have been directly linked to anxiety, worry, stress. Hmm. And he specifically says, why worry about the length of your life? Why are you so worried about how long you're going to live? Now, God is in control of how long we're going to live. God has appointed a time. Whether you like it or not, that is your time. Amen? Now, some of you are going to say, see, honey, spouse, you were trying to get me to eat better and exercise more. And pastor just told me, it don't matter what I do, I'm going to die whenever I time to die. That is not what I'm telling you. And that is not what God is saying here. That's not what Jesus is saying either. Amen? That's like seeing the, the old lady that turns 100 and she's been smoking cigarettes and eating bacon her whole life and saying, I guess that's what we all need to do. Well, I'll go for the bacon part, but... Listen, you do it, you may die tomorrow. She may die to 120 because, again, God appoints the time. But you should be doing the best you can as far as exercise, eating vitamins, eating right, etc. There's nothing wrong with that. If you've made a uh, New Year's resolution to go to the gym, knock yourself out. That's good. Why you had to wait till January 1st, I don't know. But hey, we don't always make a whole lot of sense. So, but that's good. Go! I'm glad you're doing that. But understand this, you're not lengthening your life. You may be improving the quality of your life. You with me? But you're not lengthening your life, because guess what? God's appointed a time for you. And, the, and some of the healthiest people I've ever seen are the ones that had heart attacks, strokes, gone. I don't mean to scare you. I'm just telling you that's life. This, this, this shell thing that we have is just a broken shell of a body kind of, I mean, you can do the very best you can. I remember several years ago, we had a teacher whose husband ran every day. That guy was in the best shape. He was, man, several miles a day. He'd run all the time. One day, boom, stroke, can't talk. Like, I'm not, I'm not, you, you're, you don't, don't say, well, see, there you go. We shouldn't be jogging. It's bad. I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you, look, you know, this, this what we got, this, this is all we got. And, and we try to improve the quality of your life. I want you to eat better this year. I want you to take your Flintstone vitamins. I, I, I want you to exercise, okay, more than just this every night. That's the remote control, okay? You understand? I want you to improve the quality of your life. Why? So that you could serve God to the very best of your ability. I want you to serve God to the very best of your ability to that appointed moment when he takes you home whether it's through death or whether it's when he blows that trumpet in the air, which I hope is before the end of this sermon. And probably you do too. Okay? You do things to improve the quality of your life, but, you know, just understand, you're not trying to improve the length of your life because God is in control. He has always been in control. I think we can get one more point, and then we'll do our Lord's Supper. Look at verses 28 and 29. And why are you anxious about clothing? Oh boy, here we go. Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon, the richest man in the history of the world, the Bill Gates of that era, that's the only guy that they, when he wanted to make the superlative, when he wanted to make that big exaggeration of a point, he said, not even Solomon with walls of gold in all of his wonder 
could clothe himself like one flower. I don't care how pretty of a picture you take. I don't care how, I don't care what kind of fancy printer you get and what kind of, you know, professional quality camera you have. Do you agree with me? The light, the colors, the, the way that a flower looks on a picture is nothing compared to what it looks like in real life. You just see it and you're like, wow. We were walking the dog yesterday and he was sprinkling and my wife was holding the umbrella at a weird angle to keep the sprinkling from hitting her hair or whatever. And, and I looked down and I said, wow, that is a pretty flower. Because like it just there was just this flower that had popped up and I was like, wow. You, I don't care what, they got a lot of colors in the 64 box of the Crayola, but they ain't got those colors. Because God makes colors we just can't create. That's what I'm telling you. You can go to Gucci, Prada, I don't know, members only. Yes, 80s, yes. I, you can do all that you want, and you ain't going to find clothes that are going to stay good. They're good one day, and the next day they're out of fashion. I mean, people, some of you still have, like, bell bottoms in your closet. They've gone in and out of fashion at least three times. Okay, look at, look at this. Some of the younger guys are looking at me like bell bottoms. What is he talking about? Listen, listen. If he can take care of the flowers, you ever, you ever seen those memes on, online where you'll be concrete and all of a sudden like a flower will pop up through the concrete? <laughs> Unless somebody who's just a moron, and I, I'll grant you, there are some morons out there. But unless somebody was a bonehead, I don't think anybody was planting a seed in the crack of the cement. That's God. Like, that's just God. I remember once in a while he does those kind of things, just kind of remind us, I think, sometimes, to like, look how awesome God is. If he can do that, can't he take care of you? I, I have trimmed back. I remember Bonnie giving me um, some some lessons on how to, what'd you call it, deadhead? Deadhead the roses. I've been deadheading them for a lot of years before I learned how to do it correctly. And guess what? Somehow those flowers kept coming back beautiful. Even though I don't have a green thumb, I don't even have, like I don't even have thumbs when it comes to taking care of flowers. And yet God just keeps bringing them back beautiful. That's how awesome he is. And it's like sometimes I'll trim the wrong thing, the wrong branch, they don't come out, and it's like they come out a different side. It's, it's almost like God says, look, I don't care how stupid you are, I can still bring beauty out of this. Like that's how awesome God is. No matter how bad I screw things up, he says, well, I can still bring beauty out of this. Wow. Listen. I know, again, I said I wasn't going to say it again, but I keep saying it again. I'm not belittling it, and I know some, you need to see a doctor, and I know some needs medicine, and I know some is hereditary, and it's, it's, it's biological, and all of that. But lots of times, let me say it this way, sometimes, how about that? So I'll be fair to everyone in all situations. Anxiety is really just unbelief in Christ in disguise. You got anxiety. Now listen, some of us have anxiety, and it's tough, and it's, I mean, we need medicine. And I get that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people like me. I, I don't have that, that medic, I don't have that need to see a doctor, but I stress sometimes. Are you with me? Are you with me? So I'm talking about people like me. I have no reason to be stressing because I know for a fact who my God is and what he's about. So what I'm doing is just showing a lack of unbelief or a lack of trust or a lack of faith in those moments when I stress. You know, when the doctor says, I need you to come back in, I need to see you. I don't want to see you again. I didn't want to see you the first time. My wife made me go the first time. I don't want to go back again. 
Hmm. Well, whatever news he's got, it doesn't change God. Look, some of us, you think you had a tough 22? I'm just going to be real with you. Some of you are going to have the toughest year that you've had in your life this year. It just is what it is, right? Some of us are going to have things you have no idea right now what are going to happen. It's going to happen, and it's going to be tough. I don't mean to scare you. I don't mean to depress you. What I mean to say is, even then, God is bigger. We've got to prove that we believe that. And I'm not just saying that the things you're going through are not hard. Because I know that a lot of you are going through things that are harder than what I'm having to go through. We, we, you know, we lost my, my wife's mom this week. She's in heaven today. I'm not saying it was easy. I'm not saying I'm glad. I'm not. But what I'm telling you is I know that since I know Jesus, I will be again with her. My wife will be with her again someday. I mean, it was bad. It was hard. But God's bigger. I know you're facing hard times. I know you're facing tough times. But isn't God big enough and powerful enough to meet, their, meet your needs? Don't worry about those things. Well, that's easy to say, huh? Don't worry about it. God is in charge. Now, again, I want to get super practical. Some of you have a real problem with anxiety. I get that. And I'm not saying go home and take all your pills and flush them down the toilet. Don't you dare. What I'm telling you is, go to God first. Go take that to God. Take that problem to God. And then use those other things as he shows you and reveals to you to use those things, to treat those things. And I bet those problems will get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. We've been reminded this past week that God is really in charge in my family. His, his hands are bigger. His hands are in charge. Yeah. Now, before we close and do the Lord's Supper, I want you to think about this. It makes no sense for us to say, I, I accepted Jesus in my heart. Did you accept Jesus in your heart? Okay. So what you, when you accepted Jesus in your heart, what were you saying? What, what were you saying by your actions? By accepting Jesus in your heart, what were you doing? Saying, I trust God to take care of me for eternity. I know that if I were to die today, I will be in heaven, absent from the body. Okay, that was weak. Let me try it again. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Right then. No purgatory. Okay, that's the DMV. That, there's, no, there's no such thing. Good joke, people. If you work for the DMV, I apologize. No, there is no purgatory. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Okay. It makes no sense for you to say amen to me. When I say you accepted Christ in your heart, what did you do? Oh, I trusted God for eternity. Really? You mean you had trusted God for something you've never seen? Right? It makes no sense then to turn around and not trust God for what I do see. Which, by the way, is temporary. So in other words, I trust God, who I've never seen, by the way, to take care of me forever in eternity in heaven, which I've never been. But I'm not going to trust him to take care of me in the present, the temporary, the short term. Amen? I don't know, maybe that helps one or two of you, but I, I, just, I read that somewhere this week, and I was like, ooh, wow, that just punched me right in the gut. If, for no one else, I'm making that point for me. I was like, wow, that is a great point. Why am I going to stress and worry 
about things in the temporary when all I do is preach about how I trust him for eternity. Amen? If I know without a shadow of a doubt God's got my eternity in line, um, I think tomorrow is part of eternity. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I love that. Can't doubt God's promises. He's made a promise that he's going to take care of us. You can't doubt God's promises. He's made a promise he's going to take care of us. Nothing I said today means that we're not going to have trouble, because we are going to have trouble. i, I got to be real with you. 2023 is going to have just as much trouble as 2022. Maybe more. Because people are really good about inventing new ways to cause trouble. But God isn't going to change. Those people that you depended on in 2022, I want to be honest with you, some of them are going to let you down in 2023. God won't. That excellent report that you kept getting your whole life all the way through 2022 uh one or two of us three of us hopefully not more maybe more we're going to get a bad one of those this year it's going to happen why do i say that because we're broken down people we're sinful people we're in broken down bodies we're in a sinful world um no matter how much you try to promise me right now that you will be back here january 1st next year it's December 31st, 2023, no matter how hard you try to do that, if you all promise me you're going to try the very hard, the very most you could, some of you will be gone and with the Lord. I mean, that's the numbers that there are out there. It just is what it is. Some of us won't be able to. Maybe we'll not be with the Lord, but situations will be where we can't be there. It's just the way it is. All of that stuff can change. Your health can change. Relationships can change. People can let you down. Your body will let you down. God will never let you down. 